Good morning. morning. Marilyn, thank you for welcoming us with your music. Did anybody go outside last night? Nobody? I drove through town last night around 8.30, and your town smells so good. It was like somebody was burning something, many people were burning something, it smells so good. Thank you for having a good smelling town. Wow. Victor, are you preaching on Psalm 119 today? On the Word. Okay. Well, the scripture reading is from Psalm 119, and it's about the Word. And what hope we have in the truth of the Lord. What hope do we have? True, eternal, actual hope that we can rest on. A concrete, a foundation of concrete is not, is, is weaker than standing on the eternal hope of the Lord. Granite is not firm enough compared to standing on the Lord. Let's sing about how our hope is is on the Lord and his promises. So song number 558, my hope is found, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's stand and sing. was great singing and thanks Mark and Marilyn for leading us that was great good morning everyone good to see all of you here on this beautiful Sunday morning welcome to guests that we have with us I know that we have some met one already from Calgary Mark good to see you welcome here and others as well Uh, also um, those who are watching our service, any listening to our service, glad that you have joined us. So as already mentioned, the Pastor, Pastor Victor's message is based on one, Psalm 119, and Art's gonna be reading the first few verses of Psalm 119 shortly. And these verses remind us that living in obedience to God's word 
will help us to stay pure and help us grow in our faith. So to connect with that, I also chose a verse from Psalm 119 for an opening scripture, and I'd like to read verse 105, a familiar verse to most of us, I'm sure. Psalm 119, verse 105, says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. The Bible can be our light to show us the way as we go through life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, the Bible. Lord, we thank you that we can use your word to guide us through life, that it is a living word, as relevant today as it was when it was written. God, thank you that your word is sure, that it is unchanging, and lives are changed as people read it. Thank you for the freedom we have to own our own Bibles, to read them whenever we want to. Father, help us to be obedient to your word. Grant us wisdom as we read and study your word. So Lord, thank you also for this day, this beautiful day outside that you're giving to us today, Lord, for another Sunday where we along with churches around the world, gather to worship you. Father, may all that is said and done be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Ask Mark to lead us in a couple of more songs. Our next song is also kind of high energy, which is good. It's number 5050, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. If you're able, will you please join me in standing? If not, that's quite all right. Let's sing. Next song is number 538, The Love of God.
We have a number of announcements to highlight this morning. Some are in your bulletin and some are not. So I'll try to um, to go through it quickly. Um, our missionaries of the week are Don and Shar, and as has been mentioned before, Don and Shar and their son Zane will be returning to the Philippines on October the 5th, and they ask that we continue to remember them, pray for them as they deal with all the details of uh, returning. There's uh, a potluck coming next Sunday, so you've got an insert in your bulletin. Uh, it gives a lot of information or some information about it. Uh, important thing to keep in mind is that our service begins at 10 o'clock next Sunday, not 9.30. So 10 o'clock, and we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall, and then the potluck lunch is there right after the service. Um, there's still some help needed with bringing some food, with uh, helping to set up or even clean up. So there are some sign-up sheets in the side foyer, and so on the table there. So if you could uh, help in any way, that would be appreciated. Pastor Dean is ministering this morning at Buller Center. Uh, we have uh, deacon nominations um, happening. They, today is the first, first Sunday for you to submit ballots and then again next Sunday. It'll close next Sunday. So there's inserts in your bulletin on that. There's, uh, one of them is mostly an information sheet and then the other one, the single page, is where you can uh, write down the names of those that you would like to nominate as deacon. Um, the names of those presently serving are listed there. Uh, George Elias's term has expired. The others have not yet. So George is eligible, eligible to be nominated, but don't nominate any of the others because their terms have not yet expired. Uh, at the end of the service today, if you've had a chance to write down some names, there will be deacons at the exits as you leave. This morning, you can uh, hand your, your um, nominations to them or your, your, your paper to them. Um, and if you don't get it done today, uh, you can uh, hand it in next Sunday. Or if you're in church during the week, uh, you can drop it off. There's a suggestion box. That foyer, just to the right of the mailboxes, close to the south wall, there's a box mounted on the wall, a suggestion box. Uh, you can drop it in there during the week. Men's morning prayer time has begun. That's on Wednesdays, Wednesday mornings. And uh, a little further down on page two, there's information about a prayer breakfast uh, kickoff. So that's happening on the 23rd. Paul Penner is um, going to be the guest speaker for that event. Uh, under the Discovery Groups and Bible Study, uh, a few things to mention there. Uh, so they're all beginning this Wednesday, September 13th. Uh, so George Elias's group meets here in the church at 2 o'clock. Again, that's this Wednesday. Jake Hildebrandt's group, um, I believe the, the time is incorrect there. It says 7 p.m. I think it should be 2 p.m. Is that correct, Jake? Right. So at 2 p.m., take note of that. Um, and Pastor Dean's group meets at Oakview Terrace at 7 on Wednesday. Uh, youth is also starting this Wednesday, so we have a lot of things starting on Wednesday. Uh, that's happening at Myron and Barb Dirksen's house at 7.30. And then one that is not in your bulletin, a Sunday school uh, will be beginning in two weeks. So Sunday school begins on September 24th. Keep that in mind. Missions Committee, if you're part of that committee, you have a meeting on Tuesday, September 12th. Uh, persons with health needs, so we have um, Caroline Ham and Ann Thiessen at Boundary Trails, Dave Weeb in Notre Dame, Mary Duick and John Suderman are still at Swan Lake Hospital, and Abe Friesen is in the Manitou Care Home. Uh, two names to mention that are not in the bulletin. Uh, Alf Dick 
is still in the hospital. He is struggling with sleep deprivation. So please pray for Elf and Val, and that Elf would be able to, to get some sleep and, and give his body some rest. Hilda Ham is in the hospital with a broken hip. So let's uh, also pray for Henry and for Hilda. We have two expressions of sympathy. One is in your bulletin and one is not. Uh, I'll read uh, the one regarding Mary Cron. Mary Cron passed away on September the 6th and her funeral will take place on Tuesday at 2 p.m. in our church. And she's a sister to Dorothy and Frank Giesbrecht and Margaret and George Enns. And then, not in your bulletin, um, Jackie Enns, wife of Doug Enns and daughter-in-law to John and Leona Enns, passed away on Friday morning at her home. So let's remember to pray for these families, for the Mary Cron family and for, for uh, Doug and his family, for John and Leona. Ushers, if you're ready, you can come forward. Uh, just also to keep in mind, uh, coming up on September 24th, we're planning to have a communion service, so we can prepare for that. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for your love and your faithfulness. Thank you for always being with us. Fathers, we experience both good times and also some challenges and heartaches. Help us to be mindful of your presence. And Lord, thank you that we can be assured that you will never leave us. Lord, we bring before you those with health needs. We Pray for those in the hospital who we have already mentioned. Father, we ask for your hand of healing on those seeking healing, that you would grant patience to those who are waiting for a place in a care home. We also ask your healing touch on others who are at home and dealing with health issues. We pray for the families of Mary Cron and of Jackie Entz. Father, grant them your comfort, your strength as they prepare for the funerals, and also for the days ahead as life goes on without their loved ones. We pray for Betty Dick, Father, for her family. You know what the needs are, and uh, we just ask, Father, that you would meet those needs, that you would help Betty and her family through this time, and that they would, that they would know your presence that they would know your strength. We pray, Father, for each of the missionaries who have gone out from our church to serve, and today we pray for Don and Char and Zane as they prepare to return to the Philippines. Grant them wisdom as they deal with all the details of leaving, and we pray again for the Agta Church that they work with and Lord, that your hand of blessing would be upon them, that you would grant wisdom to those who are taking on leadership roles. Lord, as we get into the fall season, we have many events and programs that are starting up again, and we ask your guidance for these and for those who are involved in the preparations. And uh, as we've begun our deacon nomination process, Father, we Pray for your guidance as we consider who we might nominate for deacons and ask for your help as we go through that process. Lord, as Pastor Dean ministers at Buller Center this morning, we pray for your blessing in that service. And as Pastor Victor brings us the message, give him the words to say and give us ears to hear. Now, as we take our offering, Lord, we thank you for material blessings that we receive from you. May our offering be used to further your work. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
scripture reading this morning comes out of the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalm 119, beginning with verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. O that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes, O forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts, and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Thus far, the reading of God's word. May God find us to be not only hearers of the word, but doers also. Well, good morning from us to you. Uh, we have, uh, we're gonna have a full house today. As you can see, we have a little one with us. Her name is Emma. We love her dearly, and we love her nine cousins, or two sisters and eight cousins, or <laughs> my math is bad. Seven cousins, we love them all very much, and they're, they're gonna be visiting us today. What a blessing. <clears throat> today we're gonna talk about the Word of God. Um, and as we kick off another winter of Sunday school and of Bible study, uh, I want to take a closer look at this book that we study. So I'm going to preach not only from the Bible, but about the Bible. And I want to explore uh, the question, some questions about the book that we claim to hold in high regard. What do we think about the Bible? Is it authentic? Is it reliable? <clears throat> Is it myth and story? Or are these real accounts of the experiences of people with God? Is the Bible the word of God? I preached this message here um, almost five years ago. So I'm guessing you probably don't remember it, at least not very well. But the reason I'm preaching it is because we're kicking off into a year of study now, as we do every year this time. And I thought it would be good to refresh our memories about the Word of God. What it is, what, it, what history says about it, what the Bible says about itself, what Jesus says about what's recorded in there. There's so much there. <clears throat> if I asked you to compare the sermon that you will hear me preach with the one that I have written out, would you expect them to be the same? If a person dies and his or her last will and testament is read, would you expect it to say what the deceased relative wanted to say? Do we believe that the Bible communicates what God wants us to hear? I heard a story, and you've heard it before, but it's, uh, it really makes the point. <laughs> it's a story from the late 1800s about, a, uh, <clears throat> about a, an elephant that comes into a village where there are six blind men. And when these 
blind men hear of it, they, want to, they all want to explore it close up. And they want to be able to touch it. And, and so they did. But when they did, they all came up with different conclusions about what this elephant was. One said it was like a big wall. Another said, uh, no, it's, more, it's like a spear. And a third one said, no, no, it's, it's like a snake. And a fourth man concluded that it was more like a tree. And the fifth was sure that the elephant was a large fan. And the sixth thought it was kind of like a rope. Well, they discussed the matter and they argued their perspectives louder and louder, each being partly right and mostly wrong. And the conclusion of the story is that this explains a good many theological arguments about something on which no one has the full view. This story is then used to argue that people see things from different points of view. And all of us are just groping around and experiencing different things about God and that it is really difficult for anyone to say what is actually true about what God is really like. Well, up to this point, those conclusions are perfectly logical. But the whole analogy comes crashing down when? When the elephant speaks. I am an elephant. I'm long and tall. I have four thick legs, a sinewy tail, a flexible trunk, two long tusks, and two huge ears. When the elephant speaks, all the blind men's perceptions are brought together into one understandable explanation, one that they can all grasp. And brothers and sisters, God has spoken. He has spoken in his word, expressed in understandable thoughts and words. How we regard the Bible is critically important because apart from the visible creation, most of what we know about God comes through his word. What is there that we know about God that we did not get from his word? What do we understand about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and about sin and salvation and Christian life apart from the word of God? So let's begin by looking at some of the doubts that people have and just kind of deal with those and put them aside. Some people will throw up doubts about dates and authors. <clears throat> some argue that the first five books of the Bible were written several hundred years after the events which they record. Well, it doesn't take a scholar to figure out that that'll present a few problems. If that's true, how could we be certain that the conversations between God and Moses actually took place? Or that God actually said the things that are ascribed to him? If these books were written as though Moses wrote it, then the two lists of the Ten Commandments would be exactly the same. But they're not. Moses wrote them slightly different for reasons he did not explain. But we accept them as the authentic word of God. Because Moses acted as God's mouthpiece with God's authority. If Moses' writings were not written as the Bible presents them, then the real writer was deceitful about God and about Israel and about history. <clears throat> so that's only one problem with that kind of a view that it was written much later. Well, there are also doubts about being written by men. We all willingly acknowledge the inconsistencies of people. It is no stretch of the imagination to think that the human authors of the Bible were as prone to error as we are. Therefore, we will hear the charge that the Bible is full of inconsistencies. An easy one to point to is the God of war in the Old Testament and the Prince of Peace in the New Testament. This is no small problem to wrestle with. But it does not mean that this apparent discrepancy cannot be reconciled and understood. 
or the incident in uh, 2 Samuel 24, which records that the Lord incited David to take a census. Well, that account is also recorded in 1 Chronicles 21. And in that record, it says it was Satan that inspired that same sentence, uh, census. So does that mean that the word of God is flawed? Can it not mean that both God and Satan incited David to take that census? After all, when God the Father sent Jesus to the cross, Satan seemed to be in full cooperation. Another tactic is to set the words of Jesus against the words of Paul in an attempt to discredit the inspired word. Those who wish to cast doubt on the Bible's reliability often point to human inconsistency, forgetting that the author of the scriptures is the Holy Spirit, who used the minds and the pens of men to record what he inspired. And third, doubts about falsely directed worship. Some even cast doubt on the scripture by saying that it isn't the Bible that we worship, it's Christ. The Bible didn't save us, Christ did. This approach seems to drive a wedge between Christ and his word. It seeks to put Christ as judge above the word so that when people ask, what would Jesus do? They use it as a way of setting aside the scriptures in favor of human imagination. An easy thing for us to get drawn into. It's understandable that many people have lost confidence in the Bible. People who are swayed by these doubts don't believe they have a message that can be trusted. Some go so far as to accept that all religions have the same God and come to know him by different names. It's difficult for these people to be convinced of the need to know Jesus. Some doubt that hell exists, or if it does, that a loving God would not send anyone there. There are many doubts and many doubters. But what does history have to say about the Bible? The Bible comes to us through a long and arduous process. It's not quite as neat and tidy that process as we might think. It seems like the closing of the Old Testament canon, um, the list of the writings that would comprise the Old Testament, probably happened somewhere between 400 and 300 BC, before Christ, and maybe even as late as 200 BC. The canon was later confirmed by the Council of Jamnia in uh, 90 AD, and that was, so that was after Jesus died that the books that we have in the Old Testament, they were confirmed as, as this will be the Old Testament. And it was closed. The New Testament canon wasn't closed until sometime in the fourth century when there was general agreement among the churches. It was a very human process. Yet, because of what the Bible says about itself, we believe that it was a God-guided process. God is very interested in preserving his written revelation. To Jeremiah, God said, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak. Speak what? All the words that I command you to speak and do not hold back a word. And to Moses, God said, these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. These. And then God gave him those words. If the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of Scripture, then the words of the Bible, as they are recorded in the original languages, are the very words that God wants us to hear. Now, the process of how the Bible came to be is one thing, but what about the manuscripts? None of the original manuscripts of the Bible have been found. None. So how can we be sure that they're authentic? 
Well, there are two universally accepted criteria for determining the authenticity of ancient manuscripts. Number one is the number of years from when it was written to the earliest copy. How many years is that? And the other one is how many copies exist. So let's look at three ancient writings whose authenticity is not even questioned. They are Herodotus, Caesar's Gaelic War, and Livy's Roman History. The earliest copy of Herodotus dates to 1,300 years after it was written. 1,300 years. Livy's Roman History has the shortest time lapse with 900 years after the first after it was written, that's the earliest copy, 900 years. So compare this with the New Testament. There are complete copies of the New Testament that date to only 310 years after the original writings. And then there are portions that date as early as 30 years from, from their writing. So that would seem to indicate the Bible, by that measure, should be reliable. The number of copies of these ancient documents is another thing. Herodotus, there are eight copies. Caesar's Gaelic War, there are 10 copies. And R Livy's Roman History, a whopping 20 copies. So that, they use that as a measure of the authenticity of the document. So, what about the New Testament? Well, there aren't 10 or 20 copies. There aren't just 100 or 200 copies. There aren't just 1,000 or 2,000 copies. There are over 5,000 Greek copies, 10,000 Latin copies, and another 9,300 other ancient copies of the New Testament. Wow, is this authentic? or not? Did we meet the standard? Does the Bible, I should say, meet the standard? The authenticity of the scriptures is supported by overwhelming evidence according to internationally recognized standards. So what does the Bible say about itself? Well, first of all, the Bible records explicit instructions from God. There are numerous such instances, including God's own handwriting. God, with his own hand, wrote the Ten Commandments in stone. After Moses went up Sinai to uh, receive the Second Commandments the second time, after he'd broken them on the, uh, because of the idol that his brother had made, God said to him, write down these words. For in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So when you're making a covenant, you want to know exactly what the wording is. Write down these words. Forty years later, just before entering the promised land, we read this in Deuteronomy. It came about when Moses finished writing the words of this law in a book until they were complete that Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may, be, may remain as a witness against you. So it seemed clear that the scripture was being written by Moses as he led Israel through the desert. And it says there that he completed it. He completed those first five books right there, and they traveled with the Ark. Twice in Jeremiah, three times in Revelation, as well as in Ezekiel and in Habakkuk, God commands his servants to write. He actually tells them that. So the second, second thing is, the Bible is a living and inspired word. Both the psalmist in Psalm 119, which we read earlier, part of it, and Jesus, in the Gospel of John, say, your word is truth. The Bible is not merely the collected writings of men, but it is superintended and inspired by the true author, God himself. 
In Hebrews we read, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word lives and it is capable of exposing our hearts, is it not? Paul wrote to Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Scripture does not lie dormant. It is not like any other writing, but it is at work in the lives of those who read it. Peter added this, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That's from 2 Peter 1, verse 20. The Holy Spirit is the key player in the proclamation of the word of God and plainly states that this is not the work of human authors. So how's that? God telling us himself, this is not your work. This is God's word, God's word from God and not from men. And third, the scripture is the immovable point of reference. Peter in his letter quotes Isaiah. All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Jesus made an even stronger statement when he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. There are roughly 80 instances in the Bible where it says it is written, appealing to the trustworthiness and eternal character of the scriptures. Now, when we measure things in our lives, <clears throat> we don't measure by things that shift or change. We measure in relation to things that do not shift or change. You don't take a, uh, if you had a rubber, uh, rubber band with inches marked on it, <laughs> what, would you, what would you want to measure with that? <laughs> you can come up with any reading that you want. That's not what we do. Suppose you were farming. And imagine, if you still can, uh, in the days before GPS, when you're trying to make your first pass across a stubble field. And usually the aim is to go straight, isn't it? What do you aim for? Do you aim for the fence post? Or do you aim for the cow? <laughs> it's pretty easy to figure out. The Bible is our fence post. It does not move. The text of scripture is from God and it is eternal and unmoving. Nothing is more trustworthy, more reliable, or more immovable. Now this is not to put the scriptures above God as some maybe suggest we do, or to place them as the focus of worship, but it is to acknowledge the adequacy of the Bible in its consistent witness with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that's what history has to say about the Bible. What about what Jesus has to say Sorry, that's what the Bible says about itself. What does Jesus have to say about the word of God? Jesus' affirmation of the history of the Bible is evident in the number of Old Testament people that he mentions. Jesus mentioned Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Lot, Moses, David, Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, Isaiah, Elijah, the widow of Zarephath, Naaman the Syrian, Daniel, Zechariah, and Jonah. Those are the ones I found. And Jesus speaks of these people as real historical personalities. To mention them at all 
speaks volumes about the authenticity of the Old Testament as the real history of Israel. Each person represents an account of what happened and an important piece of Israel's real past. Jesus appears with and speaks to Old Testament personalities. In the account of the uh, transfiguration, Jesus was seen speaking with Moses and Elijah. In Matthew chapter five, you might remember Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And here he stood, Jesus, on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. He stood with these Old Testament personalities and affirmed their authenticity and their ministry. Jesus also found himself face to face with Satan in the desert. And what is particularly interesting is how Jesus deals with Satan. Three temptations were thrown at Jesus, and each time Jesus responded with a passage of scripture from Deuteronomy. How's that for an affirmation of the scripture that Moses wrote? Jesus also quoted a lot of Old Testament scripture. He quoted Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, at least nine Psalms, Hosea, Micah, Malachi, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, and Joshua. And he referred to Old Testament events. Here are three. When Jesus was speaking about the last days, he referred to the event of the flood. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus knew the events of the flood were real, and he referred to them as such. Second event, the account of Nicodemus' midnight visit. Jesus explained coming events by referring to the occasion of Israel uh, in the desert and the poisonous snakes. Do you remember that? Moses fashioned a bronze snake that if anyone would look at it, they'd be saved, right? So Jesus said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus took a well-known event in the history of Israel and used it to explain spiritual truth. The spiritual truth comes alive because the event was real. And another such reference was to Jonah. If there's any portion of scripture that some Christians might be willing to believe is not real, it is the account of Jonah. But what does Jesus do with that account? Here's what he said. Some of the, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. What is remarkable about these three references to Old Testament events is that they're all accounts that many Christians believe are not actual events. But Jesus knew they were real. Is it common practice to point to a fabricated story as a sign? Do we ever do that? We point to real events as signs, not fictitious events. The blood moons in the sky a few years ago might have been considered by some to be a sign. But the cow jumping over the moon by Mother Goose, would we ever consider that to be a sign? And why is that? Because it's not real. It's not a real event. Only real events can be signs. Do we think that the fictitious men of a fictitious city 
who fictitiously repented at the fictitious preaching of a fictitious prophet will actually rise with this real generation at the real judgment and truly condemn it? Doesn't make any sense. Real events. The Bible is full of real events and real signs. Jesus' affirmation of the truth of the Old Testament scriptures permeates his life and teaching. How is it that people dare to suggest that the scripture is a fabricated story, or the work of mere men, or unreliable, or in any way false? Jesus knew the Old Testament accounts to be true. Jesus did not come as a judge of scripture. He did not change it or question it. He did not discredit it or avoid it or justify it or nullify it or disobey it. Jesus' life was anchored in scripture. He pointed to scripture, he quoted scripture, he stood on scripture, submitted to scripture, obeyed scripture, and fulfilled scripture. Jesus said, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So what place does a Bible like that have in our lives? What kind of authority does it have? One night, Eileen and I were at a Winkler's Flyer game. Anyone here go to Winkler Flyers games? Nobody? Oh, yeah, I got a couple of hands, good. Then, you know, then you'll know what I mean. I noticed something about hockey. By the way, I don't, I'm missing the sports gene, so I don't, I don't know much about sports. <laughs> but I did notice something. That when someone doesn't play by the rules, something happens. The referee is expected to make a call on the play that will affirm the rules. And the offending player will endure the consequences of his actions, whatever they are. The referee has authority on the proceedings of the game, but only as long as he adheres to the rules in the rule book. The rule book is the ultimate authority in the game. It is the one to which the players appeal and the coaches and the referees and the fans when there is disagreement. The book rules. The same is true of the Bible. It has authority in and over the lives of all people throughout all history in all situations. The same breath of God that breathed life into Adam is the, inspire, is the inspiration of the Holy Bible. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, 66 books by 40 authors over 1,500 years produced a consistent revelation of the Ancient of Days. The Bible is authentic and it is true and trustworthy. The Christian scriptures are the supreme, unchanging, inerrant, infallible, eternal word of God that presides as the only comprehensive revelation of God and the sole governing document in the affairs of God and man. Its authority and its sufficiency extend from God himself to the whole of scripture and it remains the final authority on all matters on which it speaks. So what is our response? How do we regard this Bible? Around the globe, there are people who collect works of art, whose creators have long died, long since died. And there probably isn't an art collector on the face of the earth who wouldn't cherish the opportunity to speak with the artist who created the art, to hear what the artist intended to communicate. When you go to a museum, and this has probably happened to you, you look at these old artifacts, old tools, old things, and you wonder, what in the world was that for? If only you could talk to the one who made it. God has given us his word so that we might know his intentions and what his intentions are for his creation. 
He is the creator and the artist who knows the purpose for which he has created us, and he has recorded them in his word. Paul commended the Thessalonian believers when he wrote, we thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, you, act, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. That's from 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Are we willing to accept the Holy Scriptures as what they actually are? Are we willing to believe them, to submit to their authority, and to allow them to shape our thinking and direct our lives? If your answer to these questions is yes, then let me encourage you to engage in daily Bible reading and weekly Bible study. Get into a place, meet with a group of people somewhere, somehow, where you can look at the Bible together, read it together, study it together and talk about, what does this mean? You know, and one will say, well, I always thought it meant that. And another says, well, I always thought it meant this. And there you go, you're both learning things immediately. And let's get into the word. Be students of the word. Write down your thoughts and your questions in the margins of the Bible and grow your knowledge of the Holy One. To read through the Bible in a year would probably take about 20 minutes a day. And as you read, mark the things that stand out to you. Underline them or highlight them or however you want to mark them so that when you come back, you remember, ah, yes, I remember this question or I remember this answer. So be student, let's be students of the word. And may our Bibles be to us a record of our spiritual growth. May I also encourage you to bring your Bibles to church. Follow along, take notes, write things in the margins. And, the, and one of the most important things is hold your preachers to account. If you don't do it, if you, aren't, if you aren't checking the word to see that what we are saying is true, how do you know that I'm not deceiving you? How will you know? I am not above the word of God. Let's be students of the word to hear and know the God who gave it through obedience to the teachings of scripture. And how will we regard it? I suggest we regard it as the Thessalonians. Accept it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for this precious word that you have preserved for us. And it lies around us in abundance. We can read it in many translations, many English translations even. And it is accessible. And I pray that you would put in us the motivation to take hold of it. It may not always be as available as it is today. Thank you for it. Help us, make us obedient to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we leave today, let's sing one more song together. The song number is number 540-540. I stand amazed in the presence. We will sing the first four verses, and then Victor will close us off with the benediction, and then we will sing the last verse. Will you please join me in standing?
you receive this benediction. From 2 Peter 3, 17. Beloved, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.